Hi, I'm Alejandra Reynoso, the voice of Sejo Belades on Castlevania, as well as Dawnbreaker on Dota 2, Neon in Stranger Paradise Final Fantasy Origin, and Flora, the Fairy of Nature on Nickelodeon's Winx Club. And you're watching the Points of Experience podcast. We're, uh, once again, uh, matcha. It is, uh, God's gift to us on this earth. It is one of the most delicious things in the world. I've just learned now, Joe, that you're a coffee drinker. You're a former matcha drinker. Can you, can you explain to me why you're so against matcha right now and in such, um, a, a matcha prevalent times? I think there's more places in the world now than ever that, that have matcha. Why are you so against it? You know, there's a few things I need to say about this, and I used to love drinking matcha. I still do. I have nothing against it. It's just so damn expensive, I feel like. You know, mm. like you walk in the grocery store, and everyone's telling you, like, this matcha was from a ceremonial monk's butthole, mm -hmm. and it'll give you powers, and it's just like, pay us $75 for this, and I'm just like, hmm. Well, you get, you get what you pay for it, you know? Maybe when if you, you go for the lower one. The lower, like the less expensive one, you'll get some sort of benefits. But you know, if I want, if I want, I want to go full monk butthole. If, I, if I'm gonna drink yeah. matcha, Just, well, that's that's the thing too. Is like you can taste the difference too between the price exactly. differences. Like if you have bad matcha, I I'm not kidding you. Like when I go to certain coffee shops, they 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 just throw so much sugar in there, and that's no good. You don't. Do you ever have Starbucks matcha? It's you so see how much of a joke it is. Yes, so, it um, is. Starbucks, we uh, we love you, and we hope that you'll sponsor us still. But <laughs> you got to step your matcha game up. E for it. effort. E for effort. Uh, yeah. Appreciate you having it, uh, but it is not anywhere near what you can get. Um, I mean, I don't even know. Like, the, I I couldn't even tell you the brand I get. I'm, but I'm constantly trying new brands. Ceremon ceremonial grade, top oh, it tier. Has to be ceremonial grade. It's got to be. And then, and you could see it in the color. I mean, Allie loves to, I mean, froth this baby up. But and thank you to shout out to Allie who made this matcha for me right now. Do you now put for, milk in that? It looks like there's milk. in Oh, there. milk. Yeah, we got a little froth action oh, with that. Uh, with the little milk frother you on there. You know what? I didn't mean to tell you this. I keep getting hit with this TikTok ad about mud water. Allie drinks it. Yes. Yes. Did you? It's got, she she's a huge fan of it. Have you tried okay. it? It's got like mush, like these healthy mushrooms in it. Or Lion's something, mane, right? reishi mushroom, yeah, yeah. Does it act? Does it actually help? Like, does she feel like it? It's real or it's kind of bullshit. She, she so Allie's again at, with many people. I'm sure you know she's trying to not be dependent upon coffee because it can get you. Oh, yeah. It can it can lock you in and, and you, your you. days become, you know. And as me doing you know voiceover, I need to be drinking something warm uh, to to get my my vocal cords nice and. And, you know, warmed up, lubricated, and she's kind of, uh, we like to do, enjoy it together when we can. So for her, she's not a huge, she'll drink matcha, but she likes coffee. She likes the taste of it. Yeah. And the mud water is not as enjoyable. It doesn't have that kind of, uh, like, ceremony experience for her where in the morning you're like, oh, I love the smell of coffee. I love the drink of it. And, you know, you're starting your day off that way. But she feels the, the benefits for it. She doesn't have brain fog. She feels all the things she gets from coffee from the mud water without kind of that like the taste and smell uh experience if that did makes sense did you try it i did it didn't taste too bad it actually tasted i think she puts a little bit of cinnamon in it and yeah, that also right. helps the taste have you yeah. not had it before i was thinking about getting it because it's like oh there's not a lot of caffeine in it you know like it's probably yeah. better for me mm -hmm. so i was gonna i was gonna probably do it you should try it because I want to know what your opinion is. And uh, this is not a sponsored little bit here for Mudwater. This is uh, an organic, which I'm sure Mudwater is as well, conversation that we're having about because uh, kind of as you know. And here we go. Great segue. As we always get, um, I'm I'm big into things that will help your mind, help your energy, help your focus. Yep. And uh, I have a crew out here in LA who we do like little coffee and tea meetups, and I drink matcha. And our guest, Alejandra Reynoso, she uh, is part of this group that I go and hang out with. And I got to meet her through mutual friends. And she has become uh, such a a bright light in my life. She is a brilliant actor, uh, kind soul, hard worker. And I got to learn a lot about her. We got to see, you know, kind of her process, her why she loves the craft, how she got into it. 
worked. She worked on one of the greatest animated series of all time. Uh, yeah. You're, you you also, like me, we, you got to watch Castlevania, correct? Yeah. I haven't played uh, the game, but I, the series is great. I just wish it yeah. was longer or more episodes, I guess. A little unorthodox to have four episodes, but it still was, quality-wise, it was great. Quality-wise, exceptional, and I think they only had four episodes because they just didn't know what people would think about it right away. Yeah, and. True. It was it, it was beyond good. It was amazing. It's it's still to this time. It's probably one of the best animated series of all time. Paved the way for for shows like uh, Arcane and uh, for all the other kind of animated series, especially that are relevant to to video games. And I played the video games. Like the first one I played was like for Super NES, like the side scroller ones, where it's all basically the same. Like Indiana yeah. Jones, the Spider Man, they all were just kind of like the side scrolling adventure, but the <laughs> textures were, you know, kind of inspired by the the genre of the game. So in this one, he has like the the I think it's like a ball and chain or whip. I can't yeah. remember what uh one of, who it is. Yeah. If it's Belmont, I think it's Belmont is the character you're playing as, and uh, uh, Trevor and. Uh, it was, you know, I, since then I got hooked on them. I went back and played the like the Game Boy Advance ones, and the story of Dracula. It's I think it's one of those things where people, regardless of if you're a gamer or not, you fall in love with it. And uh, the fact that she got to be a part of this really high profile show with amazing actors of the highest caliber, and uh, then continue and go on to to Final Fantasy Origin and kill it in there. It, again, I was blown away. I haven't gotten to play the games yet. I don't think you have either, uh, Stranger of Paradise, but it is on my list of one of the next games I have to play. And her performance, and you can tell as with the other uh, people in there, uh, Alejandro, uh, Alejandro Saab, who um, we will hopefully be having on the show as well. A little spoiler there for everybody here. Uh, but, you know, we seeing the caliber of acting that's done in games like this, it is raising the bar for everybody. And it's creating a standard that people are expecting now where it feels like this cinematic experience and we talk about how her performances are extremely captivating and cinematic i feel like i'm watching a movie every yep. time i see her in something um even in the series even in the games and uh we talk about that her her how she got into acting how she approaches it the teacher she's worked with um obviously her love for tea and um just kind of her her love and passion for for movies and the arts and it was a really really fun episode uh it was great to geek out with a fellow actor and i'm just excited to know her see, and to have see, gotten what, to it, know her. what excites me about like her performances is is like i'll describe it i mean obviously everyone knows that I'm not a voice actor and I have no idea what I'm talking about when it comes to You're this. You're not? But as an outsider coming in, yes, I am. Uh, <laughs> as an outsider looking in, I would describe it as a strong but pleasant. That's mm. kind of like the. I don't. I don't know if. I don't know if it's it, those two words kind of don't really go together. They do sometimes. Well, yes, they but, don't normally. But I see what you're saying. Yeah, like she has the delivery, but it's also like sounds. Good. I, I, I th this is just me. Well, like, I know I'm. I'm gonna pick up right where you're. You're. you're what you're handing me because Saifa, she has this kind of. It is. It's very, and it has to do with how grounded she is in her performance. It is. It doesn't feel forced, but she is a strong character. She's a freaking yes. badass. Like I don't know if it's classified as like a sorceress or somebody. But it's who's so magic. soft. Or, yes, and it has yeah. kind of a, a welcoming. Um, it makes you don't it, like it, a lot. A lot of times in animation and in anime, it, a lot of times you're it's like very stressed. The performances, the, the characters are right. very screamy, and everything. There's, there's, there's a lot of like forceful passion, and that's what's and that so is, cinematic yeah. about this story in Castlevania. It it it's a slow burn, and it takes you on a ride. And the characters are very real. And her performance in Castlevania was something I've admired, and it was it was amazing to sit down and, and get to talk about that and and get to know her uh, more. So I I, I hope um, this one is an informative episode, which it was for me, and uh, again opened my eyes to ways of thinking about art and performing and love of the craft. So uh, hang around here and and enjoy this episode of the Points of Experience podcast, but. Before you do, go to Apple Podcasts. Leave us a review, whatever you think it's worth, uh, whatever you think we've provided here. Let us know in the review. It would greatly, uh, we'd greatly appreciate it. And uh, final words here, Joe. Yeah, as always, just don't be in a, an anti poxer. Just you know, if you guys roll with us, we'll keep giving you, keep giving you bangers. Indeed.
Alejandro Reynoso on the Points of Experience podcast. Okay, so you said that you're currently now, you, you've been experiencing moments of having to plaster your face against your booth window because it's it's getting that hot right now. It's, it's that yeah. humid in there. Yeah, so the, the heat has definitely descended upon LA. I'm using my husband's setup right now so I can be outside where it's... <laughs> Not hot, not in my little sauna box back there. Yeah. Um, but I was telling you that, like, that window n- doesn't always happen, but there was one day I was in there for hours and it started to fog up the window. <laughs> that's the sign of a, a hardworking voice actor oh, right yeah. there. That's like, oh, that's yeah. got to be like your, uh, you know, your badge of honor. You, you've, you've made the booth get so foggy because you've been in God. there so long in the heat. Yeah. Do you, uh, some people, I mean, I'm the type of person, like I'm sitting right now at my desktop computer and I, I like to edit my auditions when I'm here. Some people, when they go inside their booth, they like to just do everything in there. How, how does your process work for that? Do you do everything in the booth and that's it? No. So I'll record in the booth and then I'll come out here. Like my desk is behind me right up against uh-huh. that, that wall. Um, and I'll, I'll record my auditions or I'll edit my auditions out here. Yeah. Um, the one that really like changed my thinking on that completely was Bob Bergen, actually. Huh. Yes, um, friend of the because, show. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we could say that now. <laughs> yeah, no, I saw that he was he was on uh, a few weeks ago, but um, he basically said, you know, he'll get all of his recording done, and he won't worry about editing or going back or re-recording because if you're in your editor brain or your you know engineer brain or whatever it is. You're not acting. You're not being yeah. the character. You're not focused where you need to be focused. So he's like, I get in there and I start recording and I do what I'm going to do. And then when I'm done recording, I go, you know, to my computer. And that's when when I pick the takes or when I edit or whatever it is. Yeah, um, I like to do the same thing. I yeah. feel like it's it's number one, it's uncomfortable for me to have to like be in that position where I can just where I'm standing, so to speak, and I'm in that recording mindset because I'll I'll have these moments where, like you're saying, you want to go back and kind of you know, if you're sitting there and you're like, oh, I could just re-record that, and you could just sit there all day until right. you know, and the the words don't even sound English anymore; it just sounds like you're, <laughs> you know, and like you, you know, because you've had those moments where you're like, oh, I didn't like that. And mm-hmm. that thought immediately was like, no, like, there's no way this character is sitting here being like, well, I didn't like the way I said that. So I'm going to say that again. Right? right. Like you're you're in conversation with someone. You're in the middle of something. Yeah. And if you have time to think, oh, that sounded weird. I'm going to do that again. Yeah. Something it's... something wasn't connecting. Exactly. We, we So many times we bring that up on this podcast where we have people who are, well, it was a very big lesson for me. When I first started acting, you learn a lot about people who are really good indicators. They can indicate emotions or Mm -hmm. the experience that they want an audience to perceive really well. And there's tons of famous actors who have careers off of being wonderful indicators. They're not feeling a dang thing. But for me, and I'm curious if this is the way it's for you, I have to... I have to start from the top down. I got to understand the character. I have to become the character. I have to be experiencing as much as I can of what is happening, even in voiceover. You know, like I have to be living those scenes, even though I'm standing, you know, barefoot in my in my room here with all these LED lights. I still have to be. It's almost like green screen acting for me uh, Mm. to, to authentically portray whatever the nuance is for that performance. And I think that's what separates kind of the. The pros from the Joes, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it. Uh, no offense to anyone named Joe. <clears throat> Joe here, no offense to you. <laughs> uh, but really, those, <laughs> Yeah, I'm not going to take offense to that. It's do right. not. Listen, we've, we've, we've crossed this bridge many times about that phrase, so I'll, I'll put it to rest now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, so for, for Alejandro, I mean, what what is your background in terms of your process or, or your your life as an actor. I know you went to college and everything. Where did your love for performance art, the craft of acting, watching either movies, video games, whatever has like where did all of this originate for you in your life? I mean, it came from watching movies, you know, and and seeing people performing and and feeling moved by media. Mm-hmm. Um I love storytelling in all its forms. Uh, that's kind of what does it for me. And so um, hearing you talking about, you know, indicating versus genuinely feeling something, 
that's the goal, right? Mm -hmm. And and I've had those moments where you know you're connecting because it's just happening. You're not thinking about it. Yeah. There's a moment that you go and you do something and then you come out on the other side of it and you're like, okay, that, that felt great. And there are times where it doesn't feel like it's working. <laughs> Right. And uh, oh, to bring yeah. it back to to the Joes of um, <laughs> <laughs> of this industry, he's this great actor, theater background, voiceover actor by the name of Joe Oakman. And he mm. coaches. And something that he says is that technique is there for when it's not coming naturally. Right. So I believe so strongly and so deeply in studying and and honing your craft i don't think you're ever above learning you're never at a place where you're like i have arrived and now there's nothing else i can learn or there's nothing i can practice or work on you know it's, it's all a muscle and you want to get those reps in so that those those neurons keep firing you know yeah um and so that was a big thing for me because it's easy to get down on yourself in those moments where it's not happening and you're getting a little too cerebral about stuff because it mm. happens like we all get into these weird dips you know, and sometimes it's hitting and sometimes it's just not. And then that's when that's when you rely on technique, right? That's yeah. when you rely on training. That's when you mine the source material. Like sometimes it just clicks, right? You go into something and you can go into something cold, which which happens a lot for us, especially with video games. And you feel like it's hitting and it's dynamic and you're connecting with the character, with the material. It feels natural. And then there are times where you need something to be able to generate that truth you know you need to be able to feel it and live it and those are the moments when the technique comes in mm -hmm. when you say you need something what does that something often become whether that's the tool from your toolbox or the technique you pull from what are the things that you constantly see yourself looking towards for help when you're in those times of like, you know, I'm swimming without a, a life draft here. What are, what are the things you turn to? It ranges. Um, I like the idea of working from life. So um, for me personally, I don't know if you've read Ivana Chubbuck's book. No. Um, I'm going to roll back here and grab it because I have Please it nearby do. just so Let's... I can show it to you. We got the power of the actor. The Chubbuck technique. Can you give yeah. me the, uh, the 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 bullet points on that? So basically, um, it's a twelve it's a twelve step technique that she works on, but she works a lot with substitution. Mm. Um, and also finding what works. Um, so sometimes when you're coming from a cerebral place, there is something that you think automatically, yes, this is the objective. This is what the character wants. Um, this is the person in my life that maps to. This will be great. And you do it and something about it is just falling flat. Mm. And so maybe you mix it up. You try something else and you find that that, for whatever reason, is is igniting something in you more. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of it is discovery, but it's also uh, having to do a lot of self-reflection to kind of find those things. And that's like, that's, that's a deep dive. That's a lot of work. That's heavy stuff. Yeah. And then there are the things and something that Joe taught me, which is find where something lives in your body. You know, you yeah. don't like, you don't always have the time to sit there and mind stuff. And that's why this is the kind of stuff that on your off time, on your training time, when you're not actually in a session that you've booked, cause you're on the clock and you got to yeah. just work your, you know, think on your toes, but this is the kind of stuff that on your own time you sit with and you put on its feet and, uh, you work through stuff because that's all stuff that comes in later than it lives in your body. Mm. Right. And this is for a lot of, this is more off book on camera sort of stuff, but it all feeds in because an yeah. actor is an actor is an actor, you know, and so you're bringing all of those pieces of yourself to something ultimately. But something that Joe taught me was in those moments, trust that you've done the training, the technique, the technique is all there, right? The, the repetition and the hours, it's all there in the moment you want to simplify and dive mm. and you want to discover. So he's big on go cold into something and discover stuff along the way. And then catalog where you feel emotion in your body 
So whether it's in your chest or your, whatever emotion it is, it's anger, it's passion, it's love, it's fear. Where in your body do you feel that? Just viscerally thinking about it. And then tense those parts of your body as you work through the material and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's a the, quick way to get out of here and into here. And that's kind of the biggest um, obstacle I think a lot of voice actors come into because we we – by the nature of the craft, we're limited to to standing and only using our voice, or at least that's the only thing that's truly captured. And with some microphones, you're you got to be kind of dialed into a certain direction where you can't kind of you know turn your head back and go oh you know they're gonna be like hey, hang on can you do that again because you did that completely right, off and of generally mic. you remember but we've all gotten the note from your engineer it's like uh, sorry you went off access a little bit can yeah. we take that again it's just a technical thing I'm such an offender I, engineers hate <laughs> me so often like what I do too is I wind up getting into and again, Again, this is talking about using your body. I, as I'm acting, I get further and further into a squat, depending upon the character. It happened a lot. When so the I was mic working. ends up like up here. Yeah, and they're like, "Paul, you're you're dropped." And I'm like, "Really?" Because like I get into like that. I'm really trying to get into my body to find wherever that like I feel connected to the ground, and I'm not just kind of this stiff person. Because as I'm getting kind of more buoyant in my body. I find it more organic to find the variance in whatever the emotion is. If I'm kind of penciled straight, it's hard for me to find whatever that emotion might be whenever it comes, uh, especially, like we said, getting off access and stuff. Yeah, uh, absolutely. For you, so did you, because I know, well, I do I do want to say this first too because it came to me before and I, just, I almost forgot, but this is very important. It might be the most important part of the entire podcast. You as an actor... Mm. Um, I love how kind of there is this new wave. It's it's not even a new wave of people because I say this all the time. I've been we you know you've been working at this for a long time and so have I or long time is relative. But you are one of the most at least in these you know you've worked on some really really big projects in in the last few years. I mean we're talking you know Final Fantasy, Castlevania, and uh, you know, Dota, all these kind of mega franchise type of things. And your performances are some of the most. I always think like for me when I see uh, jobs I auditioned for and I'm like, oh, I totally could have done that. It would have been a little different, but like I totally could have done what was seen there. But I, OK, they, they went that way. What's fine. When I see your performances, I'm I'm like that role was crafted for Alejandra. It's you have such a cinematic way of portraying your characters in a an animated fashion. And it comes from, I believe what you're saying is that grounded truth Whatever it is that you're bringing to these characters, it just it feels so synonymous with who you are in that it, it, it's just so truthfully organically presented and it's it's inspiring and obviously as we're preparing for this as I'm preparing for this podcast, I'm watching a lot of your stuff and I'm just every, every moment I'm just kind of like sitting there like this, I'm like, holy shit, this is so good. Oh my gosh. And it's no mistake that you're in these kind of very popular, prominent, titles that you are and you know someone might stop at castlevania and go okay that's a it's a pretty big deal right there. that's a huge franchise and i want to talk a lot about that but mm -hmm. even with final fantasy um you know you as neon on that character I, I wound up watching that scene i haven't gotten to play the game yet but i watched the scene where you show up kind of and you meet all the other warriors of light as they put it and that scene it's just there's such i don't feel like i'm watching a video game you know, I feel like I'm watching a movie and I'm not saying that every other moment in every video game is going to be like that. But you ever, when your character's on the screen, I'm like, holy shit, that could have just been like they might have just like CGI'd over you doing mocap right there. And this could have <laughs> been a, a cinematic performance. So kudos to you and bravo. I'm so oh, I, I really appreciate that. Um, you're gonna make me blush. But <laughs> um, I mean, that that's the goal. Right. And it comes from growing up and watching movies and knowing what it's like to watch something and be completely lost in that you know so when when you get on the other side you know it's such a privilege to do what we do and it's also such a slog mm -hmm. to get the opportunity to get in there and when you get in there you want so badly to serve the story and the writing you know, these are huge teams of people that put these things together. And so by the time it makes it to you, there there is this sense of, I don't want to be the, the cog in the machine that 
you know, just didn't didn't grease it up enough or, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I don't want that to be the part where we stop believing in the magic. And part of that for me is just being so focused on the work at the time. It's a huge privilege and that responsibility is not lost on me. Um, And so there is a lot of of that that goes into everything and wanting to make sure that it's super real for me in that moment so that it's mm-hmm. real for everyone else, you know, and not everything is, you know, gonna, is going to hit. And, uh, you're also kind of serving this, this, this bigger idea and this bigger image. Cause you know, sometimes the, the take you love or the take that you felt like, yeah, I was in it. I was there. That's not what's serving the moment, yeah. the story, the mechanic, Right. And there's plenty of stuff in video games where it's like, all right, this is just the call out we need. You know, this is the idling. This is where, you know, Dawn Breaker's running out of HP. And so she just needs to kind of signal the the player to like, cool it. We got to, you know. Um, and so there's all that stuff, too. And you have to be ready to play ball and just and just go with the technical stuff and mm-hmm. make the most of it. But um, that's also like the the big you know, for lack of a better word, fear that grips you as an actor um, of not wanting to fail the story in the process at that point. Mm -hmm. And so um, you also don't want to get stuck there because, like I said, when you're in that headspace, you're not serving the character and you're not serving the story. Uh, And and that's ultimately what is driving me. So whenever I am lucky enough to get that booking, I'm going into it just wanting to give everything I have to yeah. that. And whether or not it hits or doesn't, you know, the uh, the effort has been put in for sure. Mm, and that's kind of the most uh, important part, at least what you would expect and hope from the actors who are so lucky to get the role is that they're going to take it as seriously as... In our circumstance, a lot of the times, the fans who have been with these series for so long in different iterations, you know, Castlevania with like 30 games prior to becoming a, a Netflix series, you know, it's a kind of a, a tall order to walk into a series where everyone's kind of going like, yeah, half the people are like, I'm so thirsty for this. And there's other another half of people, I mean, you guys have very, uh, very much proved to not be the case but historically when there's things made into uh, live action or animated series coming from video game content it's not always a, a mega success castlevania mm-hmm. was a very kind of um a historical piece of animated history where i feel like video gamers and fans of, of video games were kind of like well, okay, they uh, they <laughs> did it. Hey, they did something really freaking good here. Um, and it established a bit of trust, I think, with fans and people who are, are eager to see their favorite stories, whether it's The Witcher or um, other iterations of, of video games coming to a different format. So I remember. It also took so long for it to get made. Yeah. You know, it, it sat with so Kevin Coldy, our executive producer on this was trying to get it made for like 11 years before before it, it ended up on Netflix, you know, and uh, and everyone was basically saying animation for adults. No one wants that. Right No, this is oh, this is too dark for kids and animated. And, it, you know, at the time predated Game of Thrones, people, you know, uh, studio execs weren't into it. And uh, and. Then Netflix was like, "All right, you know, we'll we'll give it we'll give it a shot." You know, Kevin didn't give up on it. Yeah, and uh, they're like, "We'll give it a shot and see how it does." Um, I don't think anyone could have predicted how well it did. You know, in hindsight, I always say that looking at how much love and dedication the team behind it put into it, Powerhouse, Sam and Adam Deeds, all of the amazing storyboarders and animators on this, you know, there was no way that it wasn't going to be as good as it was, but no one could have predicted that it was going to become as popular as it became. Um, I'm glad I certainly didn't know that uh, when I, (laughs) you know, got involved. Um, And the funny thing is that when I first kind of found out, 
into like season two that it was getting pretty popular it was because Cam was on Reddit and saw some fan art or some cosplay. I don't remember what it was. It was either Sypha fan art or cosplay. And he was like, hey, Holly, I, I think I think people like this. Like, I think people really like this. How exciting. Um, and, you know, at that point, so we, we recorded a bunch of stuff already. And I was like, I'm so glad I didn't know, because then I would have gone into it, like, thinking about how all of these people were going to see it and, and how, like, important this is to so many people. And, like, you don't want to mess it up. And I'm like, I'm so glad that I didn't worry about that or think about think about that when we were finding her and, and creating her because the team was so collaborative and gave me so much agency and helping to build her yeah um which was wild to me and and as a young actor it was such a gift because it was so integral to me really feeling like i had ownership mm. over my creative voice you know when you start out you're so eager to please that you're trying to find the right answer and there isn't a right answer. You know, like, that's the point. Um, D. Bradley Baker said something, and I'm always, like, quoting other actors because I love actors, and <laughs> I so learned so much I. from that, them. You're on the right podcast. <laughs> but he said something that, to me at the time, was, like, mind-blowing. And he said, they pay you to have an opinion. They want you for your power, not your subservience. You can get anyone in there to read words. And I know you've said that before, too. Why are you doing it? And why isn't someone else doing it? They liked something or they were interested in something that you had to say about it. So keep doing that. Don't get in there and then water it down and, and you know, rush to the lowest common denominator of what you think, your idea of what you think someone else's idea is. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, for me, that experience was... Your voice is valid. We want to hear what you have to say. And whether or not that's what a casting director, a writer, whoever is looking for, I feel so much more confident now in having that and giving that. And it books or it doesn't. But in the meantime, I'm going to tell you a story. Mm -hmm. The second you get that opportunity to record the audition, it's uh, what is the version and how freeing to be able to... A lot of people I know probably say this to themselves, but how freeing to give yourself the liberty to mm -hmm. to do it the way you want to do it, the way you see the character, the way you want to put all these different puzzle pieces together and create the performance that may or may not match exactly word for word what's written on the specs. And how many times is the person who gets the job, it's a wildly different thing than what you might have read at the time. Yeah. Because it was true, it was real, it was inspiring, and I think that's the thing where kind of, uh, there's so much content, the thing that we're lacking is inspiring performances because there's so many people who have access to, um, you know, a microphone or whatever it might be. There's, you know, agencies popping up every different minute, different ways for people to, to get involved in this. There's no better time to, to want to become a voice actor and to kind of get, you know, throw your name in the ring. Um, but at the same time, we've seen historically, there's been the same voices that voiced a lot of the same characters throughout time. Now we're seeing these new people pop up mm. and those performances are like, wow, that was at least what I'm seeing. I'm like, wow, that was a really, I wouldn't have expected that. That's somebody new. Bravo to these new people. When, when those opportunities come around, it's because, yeah, it's, you haven't seen that because we haven't seen this person yet sometimes, you know, yeah. we haven't had the opportunity to, to meet a new face or, or hear a new voice and, um, Trust me, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I want to keep working. I want to keep having a job too. But you know, when you have that, uh, that because it's hard to have that freedom that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. To yeah, yeah. I mean, it was an incredibly unique experience, and I'm so grateful that I had it because some people are already there, you know, and that's great. There are some people that get into this, and um, you have the talent, you have the ethic, you have the drive, and for whatever reason. That, you know, you're one of those enlightened individuals that just has that. And I wasn't really there. You know, I was still, you know, I was hardworking and I was driven and I was doing all the right things, you know, and, and there was still something there 
where you just didn't trust yourself, Mm. you know, or there's that sense of imposter syndrome, you know, and, and that was uh, a good experience for me to just really take ownership, you know? And so the fact that they took a chance on me um, when I wasn't there yet in my own head uh, was, was wild. And it's also, (laughs) you know, actors are really good at the whole like fake it till you make it thing, you know, cause we're, we're professionals. And so you get in the booth and to everyone else, it's like, you're a professional and you're in there working, but no one knows what's going on, uh, you know, in your head. And sometimes, yeah, you just need to learn like, like if, if you're going to tell yourself a story, make it a good one. You know, sometimes the, the talk button is off and they're figuring out what they want for lunch. Okay. And you're over here thinking like, wow, that last take really sucked. And they're like, they, you know, they're trying to figure out how to even give me direction to fix this. You know, sometimes there's nothing to fix, you know, it's just, it's in your head. Yeah. And, um, and I think experience gives you that clarity. And, you know, for me, that was, that was the experience that did it. And a, and a wonderful experience for both a viewer and participant. Uh, <laughs> gosh, it's such a good one. I want to take a step back real quick. And, uh, sure. you know, you, you grew up in Southern California, correct? I mean, so, mm-hmm. you know, somewhere local to here, I imagine, in some capacity. Um, where, what kind of kid and where, where do things kind of start for you? Did you do high school theater? Where did this love um, really kind of um get into you or, or was it presented to you where you was there a favorite show or a favorite movie that uh, a performance that inspired this kind of lifestyle that you're living now <laughs> what inspired this kind of lifestyle because <laughs> it's you know what and, and this is not a life for for the for any you know it, this is a hard business to to get into and it is a, a lifestyle because and to stay in it is my gosh i you know the sacrifices that have to be made at every turn or the you know uh we're not we're not doing operations here you know we're not doing brain surgery as people mm-hmm. say but my god by by gosh it is hard to mm-hmm. pursue a career in the arts it is very hard um and we don't get the credit that rightfully so that you know doctors get or scientists but uh it's not a it's not as easy as getting a degree and then writing your name on the um application or whatever and and just getting a job it's it's hard um but anyway back to that question i was asking (laughs) yeah so so i grew up in la um and when i was a kid i got scouted to do commercials um Maybe taking it a little further back, my dad, uh, my whole life was a projectionist, motion picture projectionist. Yes, I remember. Yes, yes. Um, and so I grew up watching movies, you know, and, and I'd get to go to work with him and, you know, I'd be up in the booth and all the rails are going and the lights are going and I get to go sit in and watch movies. Um, I remember going to work with him when Lord of the Rings came out just so I could watch it over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> and then my mom would come pick me up afterwards and she'd be mad at him for letting me watch it because I was I was terrified of Gollum. <laughs> so it's like I loved the movies, but then we'd be driving home and it's like dark and I'm like freaking out, you know, and having nightmares about Gollum. Um, you're just hearing Precious over and over in your yeah. head as you're sleeping. <laughs> yeah, I loved those movies. And, uh, you know, he also worked at um, the Egyptian Theater in Hollywood for a time. And so, you know, they used to run all the great black and white films and, you know, Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall. And, um, I loved big trouble in little China Mm. and I got to meet John Carpenter at an event there once. Um, and I loved like the original claymation Kong and, uh, you know, had all these VHSs that we played over and over again. Um, so I loved movies Yeah, And, and I grew up with a dad that loved movies and encouraged that. Um, you know, and he really liked Ghibli too, because they used to get those in at the Egyptian. So, you know, watched all the studio Ghibli films and, um, was at the Egyptian theater with him. Uh, and I was just, I was playing down in the lobby by myself and uh, an agent, um, like a talent agent scouted me and went to talk to him and was like, Oh, have you thought of putting your daughter in commercials? And he was like, Oh, I don't know. And he and my mom kind of talked it over. And because of that, you know, I, was enrolled in acting classes. Yeah. And I really liked that. Um, I was kind of a shy kid, you know, a little introverted, a uh, lot of stage fright, 
but I loved acting. Mm. And so, um, you know, I did commercials as a kid and in high school did theater and uh, some dance and before any performance for anything, even if it was just in our class, I was sweating. I was nervous. It was just ugh, like the worst. I hated getting up in front of people, but I loved acting mm -hmm. and I loved studying the craft and I loved movies and I loved stories. And so I did it anyway. And then um, when I was about 16, 15, 16, uh, my commercial agent basically gave me an internal referral to the voiceover department because they needed some younger voices. Yep. And so my commercial agent just talked to the voiceover agent and was like, hey, I have this client. I think she'd be really good for you guys. He was like, great, send her over. And so I thought, okay, I'm auditioning for the voiceover department. They sent me an audition. I was like, all right, great. So I did it and, you know, sent it to them. And then I got what I thought was a callback. And I was like, oh, it was a real thing. So they, they actually sent me an audition that they had in the department. They were looking for a Spanish speaker. Uh -huh. So um, it was in English, but they wanted a Spanish speaker and they wanted an accent. And uh, I did the audition, got a call back, great. So going to my very first VO studio for what I think is a callback, because I'm coming off of on camera and usually go for an audition and then you yeah. go for a callback and right. And so I walk in and uh, not a callback, just a session, booked the thing. <laughs> Had no idea. It was G.I. Joe Renegades. Uh, it was a one episode thing. Troy Baker was playing my dad. Um, Kevin Michael Richardson was in the studio because he was playing Tank or like one of the one of the Joes. Yeah. Um, so I'm like in the booth with Troy Baker. Had no idea who he was. Um, and I see like I got, I got to watch Kevin Michael Richardson working on Mike. And that was like mind blowing. Right. And it was like that moment, it, the bug just bit me and I was like, oh, this is the thing. Like, I want to do more of this stuff. And there was something so amazing and so like magical about voiceover in particular and seeing what they were doing because watching them work on mic, I could see the cartoon happening in my head. Mm. It's like, there's nothing here and they're, they're building it. Mm. And I don't think I'd consciously thought before then about the people who are behind the characters in animation. Yeah. You know, you know, they're, they're actors, but I hadn't thought about it. Yeah. I was going to ask you if you knew who Kevin Michael Richardson was at the time, or if it was just kind of like, Oh, who's this amazing actor who yeah, I've never, it was just that. Before. And then learned real quick. Yeah. And, and got like obsessed, um, with with just learning more and um my next big thing after that was winx club for, for nickelodeon yeah and it was um a series regular so i was in every episode for we did um four one-hour specials to summarize the first two seasons and then we did seasons and this was like the 26 episode season back yeah. in the day so it was seasons three four five six uh 26 episodes a season mm -hmm. in studio you know seasons five and six were ensemble records how fun. Also, Ensemble Prelay. Um, and I got to see a lot of people come through that show. Dee Bradley Baker played Kiko the Bunny. And, you know, uh, Gray was in it and Kari Walgren. And, um, yeah, Josh Keaton, you know. So, yeah, you learn real quick. It was like I tell everyone that that was like VO grad school. Yeah. You know, you learn so much by seeing, like, the veterans performing. It takes you know, a certain and person. Put it on their feet. It takes a certain person to to realize that opportunity, though. You know, I'm sure you had other cast members who may or may not have had the same kind of interest or focus on VO that you did to have the foresight to be like, I need to look at all these other people and what are they doing? <laughs> how can I steal? How can I learn? What is it? Or ask questions? Whatever it was for yeah. you, because that is like you said. There's no. You can't go to grad school for voice acting. Mm. There doesn't exist. A college for voice acting doesn't even exist. So to get that kind of opportunity and to capitalize on it is a really <laughs> fortuitous and like so Incredibly smart of fortuitous. you. Yeah. And it's also you go in with a certain naivete because like you're on mic doing things for the first time. We did some ADR, you know, mm. for the Italian into English for the first few seasons. 
and you don't have any experience in this space and yet it's the you're behind the mic and the director's telling you to do a thing so you're like well i guess i must be able to do it if they're telling me to do it i must be able to do it so you just do it you know and and there's no time in that moment to second guess and be like well can i do the thing it's like no you're there just do it yeah 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 i had a very similar experience kind of very lucky to work with people who um i was able to learn from and and do those things because i didn't have it was a it was (sighs) there weren't really any resources at the time when you know similar were you know similar uh, ages to to when i was trying to pursue it it yeah. there wasn't a lot to look for there was you know there wasn't podcasts like this there wasn't um there sure as heck wasn't classes really um mm-hmm. to the degree of i mean because i mean the internet was still kind of a <laughs> you know it was still kind of relatively new when i was starting acting uh so there wasn't like a lot of people who had their own websites up there and and, and you could find uh those types of resources um so you're working on winx club and then you decide to go to college after, during, and and you don't go for, you go yeah. for communications, if I'm correct, which is also what I had originally gone for too. Yeah, well, you know, because up until this point, I'd been doing acting in school, and I, and to me, it was a recreational activity. Like I was working professionally, I was doing commercials, and I was a union actor. I joined the union, God, when I was ten or eleven. Hmm. Um, just doing commercials on camera. Yeah. And, um, so by the time I even knew voiceover was a thing, you know, I was already doing that. And, um, but to me, it was just like, this is, you know, the coolest recreational activity. It's just what I did, you know, (laughs) and I'd, I'd been doing it since I was a kid. So to me, that was normal, you know? And then I didn't even talk to people at school about it. So like no one knew. And I know, I remember someone finding out that I was doing Winx Club because she watched the show. It was a girl in my class. And uh, she thought it was the coolest thing. And then, you know, because she was talking about it, other people heard. And because I was so shy and, and you know, like you expect, like, the class clown or, like, the person who's the lead in all the school productions to be the person doing that kind of stuff. And and there were other people doing stuff. But it was, I, I remember it was a lot of people just being like, you? Like, you're doing stuff? Yeah. Um so yeah, but it was totally separate and I didn't talk to people at school about it. It was another part of my life. Um, but there was also a part of me, you know, I'd, I'd always been um, a good student and really focused in school and I knew I wanted to do the four year university thing. Um, and that was always a part of the plan. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to remember what season we were in at the time. Um, with Winx Club. Well, I know we were, we were doing ensemble stuff for five, so it had to have been into five, into recording stuff for season five, mm-hmm. um, that I got into Stanford. And so I talked to uh, our casting director at Nickelodeon about it and basically told them what happened. And they were super, super supportive. And they were like, oh, well, we'll just find a studio near campus, you know, and, and you can finish out, you know, Go into the studio once a week and we'll finish out the records that we have left. Yeah. Um, so I did. So I went to I went to school and my freshman year, you know, went in and recorded once a week just to get stuff done. I wasn't auditioning for anything anymore. I was just working on the show. And uh, we did a couple movies for it as well. And then the show wrapped. Yeah. And I was doing the college thing for the next three years. And... Um, it was something where I had to move away from it or go away from it to really realize how important it was to me because it just had kind of been my default since I was a kid. You know, it's like, oh, you, you do um, auditions after school and, and sometimes, you know, you, you're on set doing stuff or, you know, and then with Wings Club, it was so consistent. It's like, wait, we do an episode every week and, and this is just what we do. Um, and I went off and I, I did the college thing and you kind of get wrapped up in what everyone's doing and the mentality and, you know, you're in Silicon Valley and everyone's into tech and startups. And there was this sense as I was approaching graduation where I felt like I needed to make the responsible choice, the you're graduating from Stanford choice. You need to start building a career Mm. choice. 
Um, and I had an uh, outstanding job offer with a marketing firm in the Bay Area. And it was going to be like, you know, a, a summer internship where they trained you up on their software. And then in the fall, it was going to turn into a full-time position. And it wasn't sitting great, but it was also like, hey, this is good. Uh, I'd also come off of, I'd just done an honors thesis, um, in my department and I was doing like research abroad. I studied in, in Kyoto, Japan, uh, winter quarter of my senior year and I was doing research and then I came back and, uh, the spring quarter was just like writing the stuff and like transcribing interviews and, and doing all of the, it was wild. Uh, I was the only person that year, um, that did an honors thesis in my department and, uh, <laughs> you know, worked really closely with, with, uh, the head of my department on that. And, you know, I was incredibly exhausted by the end of that year and just trying to figure out what I was going to do. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't get it out of my head, you know, coming back to LA and, and being an actor, mm. you know, it's like, I just, I just missed it so much. And, uh, I still had a good relationship with my agency at the time. And, uh, it was basically my mom that, that really helped me make the decision finally, because she was like, look, you're young. Okay. You can always go get a, a real job later. So you might as well, you know, if you love this, you might as well come back to LA and, and see what happens. And like, and that's okay. And so that was another thing of like, okay, it's, it's Okay to not go and, and have the stable job and like the fixed salary yet, mm. you know, she's not going to be disappointed, which was huge. Yeah. Um, so three months before graduation, I called up my agency and I was like, Hey guys, I'm going to be back in LA in June. So if you want to start sending me auditions again, I would really appreciate that. Um, and, and see what happens. And they were like, yeah, sure. Great. Uh, and they sent me Castlevania. How soon? And, uh, how soon does that happen? Is you're still in school, or you you've, you've just yeah. left? No, I'm still in school. I recorded the audition in my dorm room. Um, at the at the time, they are uh, they're sending me like commercial stuff, a few things, right? Mm. And then there's so there's construction. They're putting up a new dorm next door, and so I would get in my car and drive up the hill to where it was quieter because mm. cars have pretty good sound dampening, and then I would pull down the sun visor. And, uh, you know, pull up the little mirror cover and stick my sides. I'd print them out, stick the sides in there and stick it. So it would, you know, be stuck in front of me. Yeah. And I would record in my car. Um, Castlevania, I did record in my dorm room, my closet. Um, but it was just one of a bunch of things that came through, yeah. right? In those three months before graduation. And then it was two weeks before graduation. I woke up and I had an email, a notification on my phone. And I pulled it up and it was my agent. And they were like, hey, um, so Castlevania would like to offer you the role of Sypha. It's two episodes with the potential for more. Yeah. Because the first season was four episodes and she came in in episode three. Mm -hmm. um, so like, yeah, it's two episodes and potential for more. Because we didn't know if there was going to be another season or if they were going to write more for her, what, what was going to happen? So, yeah. so I was like, to me, that was like, okay, this is a sign. I'm going back to LA. I have a job. And I felt like because all of my classmates who were graduating, you know, either had position security in what they were doing and I was still just kind of auditioning for stuff, but going back to LA and, uh, you know, having this two weeks ahead of time, I was like, yeah, it's two episodes. It's like, I, I'm going home with a job. Mm -hmm. Like I have a job. <laughs> 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 Isn't that funny how that like just helps your mentality to be like, okay, I, yeah, I'm like everybody else. I'm going home Everywhere. to work. We all yeah. have jobs. Yeah. 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 And so I, yeah, I did. And then I remember scheduling kept getting pushed. Like I came back and we were still trying to figure out, I came back in June and we were supposed to record in June. And then for whatever reason, I remember things getting pushed and then it was into August and I was like, is, is this happening or not? It, Am I not doing it? Um, and it was totally fine. They were just, you know, figuring things, working out. on things, and then finally got in, in like August and recorded the first episode of Castlevania. And um, yeah, I feel like I've been so privileged to be in 
like amazing rooms and it was also a a symptom of like pre-covid times you know when you got to see other actors you Mm -hmm. know and obviously doing prelay but like being able to see the actors that I got to see early on, whether it was G.I. Joe or coming through Winx Club or Castlevania, because I went in that first day and James Callis, who voices Alucard, mm. um, was was there around the same time. So I got to meet him, but I absolutely lost it because um, I grew up watching Stargate SG-1 with my dad. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're familiar with the show at all. I am not to the, uh, you know, I won't know every reference, but I am familiar, yeah. And uh, there's this amazing actor by the name of Tony Amendola Mm -hmm. who voices Master Braytek on the show. And he also happens to voice the elder, Sypha's grandfather on Castlevania. Mm. And so I was in the studio, we were at Salami Studios, and I was in there, I was, you know, behind the glass and uh, we'd recorded a little bit and we were taking a break and I see someone walk in the door through the glass and I, I just, I couldn't stop looking at him. I was like, that's, that's Master Braytac. <laughs> and then he walks in and he sits down and then they're like, okay, great. Tony's going to come in, you know, and you guys are going to record the, the next little bit together. Oh, okay. Tony, Tony's good. Tony's coming in. Um, and so he, he comes in and we record all of our stuff, uh, for season one together. And, you know, you never want to break professionalism Mm. at all. And I didn't want to make him feel weird at all, but I was also like, my dad would love this. (laughs) My dad would love this so much. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, but basically before I left, I was just like, Hi, Tony. You know, I just wanted to introduce myself, you know, because we just worked together, but we hadn't like been formally introduced. And he was yeah. like, oh, yeah, absolutely. And I said, so my dad and I watched Stargate together when I was growing up. And he goes, oh, I love hearing that. You know, you'd be surprised how many like fathers and daughters or like sons and fathers will come up to him at conventions and things and say, like, we, we watched you together. He goes, and I love that. And I said, oh, it's amazing. I said, could I get a picture with you mm. for my dad? And he goes, Absolutely. Um, and so I have that picture it's on social media somewhere um, of us in the studio, my first day working on Castlevania with Tony Amendola, like in the studio, the mics are in the background. And uh, and then afterwards he was like, why don't you give me your, your address and I'll send your dad a signed headshot. Oh my gosh. And so he did and he sent him a headshot of him, like he had a headshot in Master Braytax, like full, like his armor with the staff and everything. Yeah. And he sent him a signed copy of that, um, which is amazing. And, you know, and we're, we're friends to this day. I went and saw him, um, out in, uh, in Glendale. He was in a production of 12th night. Oh God. Good. (laughs) Um, and he's amazing. So, um, yeah, you know, that's just a random anecdote, but it was like, I'm, I'm getting to relive so much of this, just talking to you about it. I love it. Cause love the it. pandemic feels like it's been forever. Oh, I know that story but, you were just saying, I was half ex- like, I, you know, you never know I'm v- listening very intently. And I'm like, tell me this is a story where she asks for a photo and they're like, no actors don't take photo. I'm like, tell me that the story is <laughs> going to go that way. I'm like, please don't, please don't. Okay, great. It's a good. Happy ending story. <laughs> this is the don't meet your heroes. Yeah. No, he's amazing. He's still my hero. <laughs> Absolutely. But you know, yeah. that's, you, you never know what's the way these stories can go or what the lesson is that comes from it or whatever. So I, I want to just jump really quick back to the you and your college dorm room. You're mm. you're still pursuing, you know, finishing out your degree. You're you're slated to go home. Do you like? Was it being away from acting for so long and getting that audition, or was it something specifically about the character? Was it something in the sides? Was it you just kind of not having this? pressure of like I need to be an actor right now do do you have any kind of memories of that audition and and kind of maybe why it went the way it did and and you got the part (laughs) I have no idea why it went the way it did Uh um I remember the audition because I also remember because from the beginning they wanted her to have a Spanish accent uh-huh. and I don't actually have one. Um, well, you do a damn speak, good job. <laughs> thank you. But I speak Spanish fluently. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of finding her accent was just 
applying the rules of, I'm like, okay, it was just paying attention to what my tongue and my mouth did when I was speaking Spanish yeah, and just using that in English. And then also softening that in some ways because like part of her character is that it, she's a polyglot, you know, and, mm-hmm. and the, I mean, we're watching the show in English, right? Where, you know, it's, it's, there's not technically speaking English, mm-hmm. yeah. but that's what the story is, is told in. Yeah. And so, you know, it's like, yeah, she would be very comfortable speaking English. She wouldn't have issues with grammar or speed or understandability because she's fluent. Yeah. She just has an accent. Um, and so I was finding a lot of that stuff, but it was just in that moment and also just being away from acting for so long. I was looking up interviews of like Penelope Cruz because mm-hmm. I was like, oh, she's just Spanish, you know, and, and just like specifically. So I remember doing that, sitting at my desk and, and you know, just thinking about those things. And recording it. And also, there was no pressure because when the audition for Castlevania came across my desk, it wasn't Castlevania. Uh huh. Like, it was titled Castlevania. It didn't, it didn't, it wasn't, um, you know, like everything that you get now that's like Project, whatever code name it is. Yeah. Elephant, uh, Dinosaur 86. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, I, I wasn't a gamer in the 80s, you know, and, and so it didn't have, you know, like, like there are plenty of things that, you know, yeah. and as soon as it comes across your desk, there is this moment of, oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and then you try to not pay attention to that. Yeah. Like, I know you do this thing of like, we've all gone through the thing of, I'm going to do mental gymnastics now mm-hmm. and one day it's not going to matter. <laughs> Right. Um, let me know when you're enlightened and you've you've reached that plane. I will. Um, oh gosh, I'll let everybody know. <laughs> great. Tell us the secret. Yeah. Um, but it was just I had been away from it for so long, and I wasn't in LA at the time. Mm. You know, so there was like a healthy distance from all of it, and just seeing the auditions roll in, it was coming from a place of I'm getting to do the acting thing again. Mm-hmm. And so there was a level of having fun with each of those auditions. Yeah. And not having too much be attached to it. And like, yes, there was, you know, that 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 feeling of wanting to go back to something. Because mm. I was fully surrendering to the, I have no plan, I'm going to LA to be an actor. Yeah. Which is a weird experience after four years of Stanford. You know, and coming yeah. off of an honors thesis and, and doing that whole thing and also feeling like like there there is a job offer here that you are walking away from. Is that ungrateful? Is that not? So there was a lot of that happening. But I don't remember, weirdly, feeling that pressure on the auditions. Yeah. And I think I was just so grateful and happy that my agency was like, oh, yeah, we'll just send you stuff. You know, even though you've been gone. <laughs> mm. But do you think that, we even? Um, and I'm sorry, I'm just kind of put, putting the pieces together for me right now. Yeah. Maybe I'll hit a something that makes sense. Maybe I won't. This idea where you were talking about, you know, all your friends are going back from college to, to their jobs. And now you've got your mm. agency who you haven't been working with is saying, yeah, come send us auditions. You're, you know, you're doing honors thesis. You know, you're, you're, you're working really hard as a student. And maybe that whole experience has influenced your work ethic. Do you think that those all things kind of maybe subconsciously culminated into like, I'm going to do a really good job on this, but I don't, you know, there's, I don't, you know, I don't know what Castlevania is to the degree of what it's going to become on Netflix. Mm -hmm. So maybe it was just kind of the perfect storm for you where to me, I mean, it sounds like all those things would help me on a, on a performance like that. Yeah. Uh, Honestly, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm trying to give like, people I, the answers. <laughs> I know. And that's the thing, too. And that's... Here's the thing. Because I love podcasts. Yeah. And I love books. And I love all the stuff that we do. And, I'm, you know, I end up quoting actors constantly because I take the classes. I do the workshops. Yeah. And, you know, like, we look stuff up. You watch the videos on YouTube. You follow these people on Twitter. Like... Definitely, like, in 2016, when I came back to L.A., that's when when I mean, like, I became obsessed in, like, knowing this industry and knowing kind of what made it tick. Mm. You can know so much. 
and still have no idea why things happen <laughs> the way they happen, so right? True. Because we go or we try to go into every audition with the same elements, mm. right? You try to give a truthful performance. You try to do something interesting. You try to entertain yourself. You try to do something that you're going to be proud of because you feel a sense of accomplishment or a sense of, I did what I wanted to do. Mm. And you're at different points on your journey throughout it in terms of feeling like you're really serving that. Yeah. You know, or feeling the ability to be able to serve that. Like, I know you had Christina V on your podcast and she was talking about the, like, auditioning has gotten so much easier for me since I decided that this is what I have to offer you for this. This is my take on it. Yeah. And if that's what you want, great. And if it's not... Like, I, I made a conscious decision and I feel good about that. Yeah. Right? Bob Bergen also says, doesn't matter what choice you make. It matters that you make a choice. Yep, 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 yeah. So I feel so much happier and so much more confident as a creative person, as an artist now. Because when I get to go in there, not in the summer, um, <laughs> you know, I I get to tell the story that I want to tell. And sometimes that's done more successfully. And sometimes it's not, you know, you're still a human and, and like you're having your, your own emotional life and your own emotional journey. Yeah. I was still in a very early phase of, of some of that self-discovery come Castlevania. Yeah. It was, um, the kind of lucky where it's like preparation and opportunity just kind of meet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I always joke when people ask me about that. It's like, oh, I got in when the getting was good mm -hmm. in, when it comes to, to Castlevania. But um, I don't know. There was there was something about it that was just right in that moment. And yeah. it was right for casting and for writing and for, for the whole team. And, you know, I mean, that whole team is like family to me still mm. to this day. Um, so why did that work? We no idea. Yeah. But there is... Like with, with Final Fantasy, that's one where I look back at the audition and I feel like that was that was a strong audition. Mm. Like I remember coming out, that was one where you don't necessarily get much background or information. And that yep. was very much a, well, you make the decision. Like I told myself a whole story has nothing to do with what actually ended up being the story yeah. of, of Stranger of Paradise. But I remember so strongly... Um, coming out of that feeling like not remembering making conscious decisions or doing things in the booth, but yeah. coming out of it feeling like, Oh, I just told a whole story. Mm -hmm. Then like th there was no background there. It's like I created something and that yeah. resonated, you know, with, with someone mm -hmm. and, uh, that ended up working out. And actually I want to ask you about Neo. Oh gosh. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> because we worked with the same studio yeah. for both of these projects. Um, did you know that you were the main character or did no. you like walk in day one and they were like, hi, you're the main character? Yeah. Well, it's, I got the sides for all those things. And, uh, I remember I read for multiple characters and I don't know if it definitely didn't say it in the sides. I didn't even know. I mean, I've talked about this before, but I didn't even know what, I didn't know what the game was. I didn't had, I had no idea really. The only thing I could yeah. base it off of was the art. And the studio who was doing it. So I was able to be like, okay, maybe it's something to do with, you know, something Square related. I was able to kind of like do that. But I thought it was a mobile game. I really thought like that's all it was going to be. And I get in there and they tell me what it is. And I was like, oh, gosh. Wait, oh, this gosh. is coming back. And then they're like, yeah, you're going to be the main character. And Matt Ferd, who was the, uh, you know, good friend of mine now, he did the, uh, uh, he, he did all the adaptations and the localization for uh, the game. And he was, you know, helping direct uh, our sessions. He goes, yeah, well, you know, you're going to be playing the main character. So get ready for a lot of people to know who you are. And I was like, don't say that to me. Like, I'm, I'm trying to like, just like, it all kind of hit me at once, as I'm sure it did for, for you. Uh, d did you know about Final Fantasy and all this stuff? Was that like on your radar? when you got this game? Did you understand that? Okay, well, the... I, I knew what Final Fantasy was. I didn't know this was Final Fantasy adjacent. Mm. You know, it was under a code name. There wasn't much background. Um, There was some, like, character, like, sketch art. Yeah. And all they mentioned was that it was 
dramatic and theatrical and you know just just some of that and that real they wanted grounded it to performance be, yeah <laughs> you know you know yep. you've got you've gotten the sides uh-huh. right um and like i came in for the session with keith and like we just kind of you know got into doing it and then he was like okay so um this is final fantasy origin wait oh what um and uh and then at that point it was just like okay so it's it's a final fantasy game yeah still had no idea like how how central to the story neon would be mm. um just thought like okay like ran you know ancillary character probably yeah. Uh, and he was like, and so you're one of the main characters, you're one of the main party members, you're the only, um, you know, a girl in, in, uh, in the party, at least at the beginning. Yeah. Um, and so, and that's what we're doing, but like super casual and like skimmed over it. And so I'm just like sitting with this at the beginning of our first session. Yeah. And then it's just like, okay, now let's do the thing, you know? Um, so, so it is, it is a weird experience. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's why I was interested to know like how how they approach that because they're like you're you're the guy. I know. Well, you're you'd the think, guy. You'd think it would be important to know that stuff, but it's it's well like you'd think they tell you ahead of time. Like even even with code names and everything, it's just yeah. like okay, he is our protagonist. Yeah, and sometimes they do do that. I have read sides that say he is the or she is whoever it is is the protagonist of this story, and uh, it gives you a little. It gives you information at least. It, you know, it's kind of contradictory sometimes because I feel like <laughs> if you do read that, you kind of maybe because I maybe you do fall into the trope of thinking you have like, an idea oh, I have what, to, like the guy is. Yeah, so maybe for some people it's helpful, and for the people who indicate, I'm sure that's really helpful to know that like, okay, I got to make this sound protagonisty uh, in whatever shape or form that is. But you know, I I think like you said, I just approached that performance as real. As, as humanly possible. Like, I almost, it almost sounded like if I listen back to that audition, it almost has that feeling of like, for lack of a better way of explaining it, like, uh, uh, like, indifference like you know when people say like you, there's an attraction when you're like sexually indifferent to the person you're you're dating it's like mm-hmm. you're kind of just like eh. a lot of my reads were just kind of like a real 14 year old 15 year old kid when they would just kind of like say things off the cuff and there wasn't like there was no sense of me acting like again talking about listening back on auditions i'm able to say like okay i can see why that might have resonated because it was so yeah. far removed from like a, a traditional acting audition that I could okay. That's what a lot of these games are going for, and I think you are really good at doing that. And when I listen to the scenes, obviously I don't know what the audition was, but you you can tell me. But when I listen to like that scene with you and Neon, it's just so real. It's so grounded, and obviously you you you've said you've you know you read these acting books and stuff, but that that to me comes down to somebody who's done their homework they've created a character and you you said you know you're you're creating a story here you're you're Mm. telling a beginning middle and end or you're finding an action or you're finding an objective and you're that comes from writing a backstory or or at least writing a dang scene in your head i mean it's also just are you playing a character or are you serving a story Mm -hmm. because those are two different things and that's kind of it goes hand in hand with the trying to find the right answer early mm-hmm. on because there is such a need to prove yourself when you feel unproven yeah and it's like look, look at all the things that i can do yeah right listen to me you know hear me see me whatever like the, you know and, and the character gets bigger than the story and bigger than the scene and bigger than the other character they're in the scene with yeah and especially with video games it's you don't you're not in there you know like with with prelay and i mean it doesn't you know, always happen with prelay yeah Thankfully, in Castlevania, like I got to do all of my scenes with Richard, mm-hmm. um, even over ISDN, which was amazing. Oh gosh! Um, to to get you know a lot yeah. of that that banter and that that you know back and forth that they had. I love that behind the scenes video that you have of uh, I think it's like season <laughs> two or four. I can't remember which one. I think it it's four. four. I think four. it's four. Yeah, the, the is it the one where I'm like gesturing wildly and yes, yes, saying and like you make me say no shit things. or stuff. You're like you're like you're, yeah. yeah. I love that. Uh, uh, Bex. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> yeah, and you know, and, and you can hear him yeah. uh, at some points in, in that as well, but um, but yeah, you're not in there with someone, and there's 
there's also a part to it as much as like you're living in the truth of it there is that technical actor brain where it's like okay you know there there is someone on the other side of this and someone's going to be watching this Mm -hmm. and hopefully what they're seeing is a conversation between two two characters yeah like there is something to that and then you just talking about getting that audition for neo and being like okay i think this is square i think this is x y and z there's also some detective work that goes into that because sometimes like there's something to tone right as much as you want to give a truthful performance there are certain things that veer into the land of the outrageous or the larger than life or you know and then there's a truth to all of it but like mining tone and figuring that out is such a skill and and, and such a a, a a mind meld and even that happens just as understanding you go the this. things you're talking about you know sometimes people do you have auditions and you're talking about something and you don't know whether that's an animal a building or that was one of the things that, you know in for neo so you either research it figure it out or make a choice yes at the very least you make a choice it makes sense but if it is something that is like very prominent to at least what you're talking about like we had mike in my neo sides one of the one of the auditions words was he saying uh, it's it's spelt out phonetically as one of Right. Okay. It said one of but that stands for one of four, which if you're familiar with the Neo, the world ends with you game or anything in, in Shibuya, it's the, you know, the one oh nine, but the one oh four building that they have. So just mm-hmm. being able to be like, you know, you could play that truthfully anyway, but the context absolutely sets the tone for what you're talking about to a degree. So mm-hmm. you never know if the casting on their end is like, what the hell are they talking about? Like, w- wait, what? Why are they in love with this building? As opposed to like, oh, I got to go to this place that I hate or whatever it might be. So that right. detective work, like you're saying, like that's kind of when you can bare minimum. I feel like you've got to look this shit up. You got to mm-hmm. at least make a choice. Um, if you can be informed and you can find it great. Um, Otherwise, you're, I don't know, who, who, who are we to say, right? Maybe your wildly different choice will be what sticks. But if I'm going to be playing my hand, I want it to be the best hand that I think I, I can play. Uh, I want to have do all the homework. You're I trying can. to equip yourself in every way possible because there is so much about the work that we do that is out of our hands, out of our control, yeah. that we have no way of influencing. So anything that you can influence, that you can give yourself some sort of help or advantage or direction why wouldn't you Mm -hmm. right and so sometimes and it's not always the case but sometimes with animated shows they tell you the creator of such and such or these are the writers on it great look up their stuff see what what their tone is what else have they worked on you know or if it's just coming through like a studio you've worked with before and maybe you know the developers they work with you're like okay so it might be you know x y like you just start to catalog this information and you're Mm -hmm. playing this 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 detective game so uh you do wear a lot of hats as an actor and you're keeping a lot of plates spinning right you have to i mean you're trying to one like serve the story and 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 use your craft but then there's also all this technical stuff you're working on mic you know um and then you're also a detective and you're mining the material you're mining the sides you're trying to see you know what the studio tells you what the what the tone seems to be telling you there's there's a lot of of thinking that goes into it for sure one thing we haven't talked on this podcast about but it just made me made me think about this is one of the most important things that i think about and maybe you have thought about this or not is i am always curious about why they pick the sides or the lines that Mm. they pick why this scene why this moment of dialogue what are they trying what is the what what is the emotional journey at least that you can choose to make it different because like if you're playing a character that's very logical or maybe very um, bombastic you don't want to play every line exactly the same they're going to get that idea Mm -hmm. that you can do whatever that is off the first line so i always as as a detective i try to be like okay what is what can I make this scenario, this, the specifics of this, the given circumstances of this moment different than the other ones, even if they're written yeah. all the same? Like I just worked on an audition that I, I, I you know, we want to talk about the perfect storm here. It was something I knew what it was. 
larger than life for me, very big deal type of thing. I care too much about it. I'm sitting having the conversation with Ali, my fiance, being like, but do you think they want it like this? You know, I'm having the, I hear it every day, once a week from actors like you telling me it's not about that. And yet we still, I still combat that same monkey mind in my head. And we're not immune. No. Just because we know that it exists, which maybe is worse, <laughs> right? It's like we know and we're still like Cam is here, you know, the way Allie is there, like getting an earful from me when I, you know, need to give into my neuroses. And it's like, we're going to talk this through. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, so yeah, well, we're not, we're not immune to that at all. But I mean, going back to what you're saying, if you have multiple scenes, okay, why are there multiple, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, we're, we're not giving the same thing in both. Like there's a reason they need to see these things, right? So yeah, I mean, all of that stuff comes into play and even going so far sometimes because auditioning is its own beast, yeah, which is totally independent of like the actual work that you do once you book. And there are these considerations, but going as far as thinking about how does my waveform look? Right. Is it wall to wall sound? Is it dynamic? Is it going to look different than someone else's waveform? And also not just making choices to make it wildly different, right? Or to do, but making sure that, okay, if I'm getting, if they've given me multiple scenes or, you know, multiple disjointed lines, Obviously, it's to see different things. Mm-hmm. So make those choices because you don't want your waveform to just be uniform straight through. Yeah. Yes. Gosh. Well, that, that, I mean, oh, 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 that's something we haven't talked about on here. And it's such <laughs> a, a unique thing to voice over. And you would not think about it that way. But you, it's it, it's another way of creating variability within your performance so it's not you just saying this you know the same tone the same like what moments can you take a wildly different choice in the read and that comes across as maybe it's a whisper at this moment and then maybe that whisper turns into like a kind of a big laugh or whatever it might be and that kind of surprise when a casting director is listening to hundreds of auditions and they're hearing that line the same way that second that somebody does something different that's not kind of of what the the uniformity of of most people sending that in to me because i've been on the other side of the glass so to speak that makes me go oh Hmm. who was that who made that choice just simply because it was a different one. It also one. just breaks it up. Yeah. Because right? you're thinking, like, casting directors hearing hundreds, maybe even thousands mm-hmm. of MP3s, you know, for any given role or any given project. And to a degree, there is a way that humans would generally communicate maybe this idea, this thought, whatever. Like, there is going to be a certain sense of uniformity at some point. Mm. The question is, who thought about it a little bit more? Uh-huh. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. Oh, my gosh. Well, I could sit here and talk shop with you all day, and, and I want to make sure I get you out of here in a, in a reasonable time. But I would love to just quickly kind of talk about, you know, some some fun things about, like, you. Because, I mean, you, you're, we're, we've, we've kind of created our own, like, little warriors of light with, uh, you know, very graceful again to Ryan Coltley, yeah. who's going to be named every freaking episode. Gosh darn it, our that l- guy. Our little coffee co- cohort. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, something that is, um, well, there's a couple of things here. But let's start with the f- the most fun one. That as I sit here staring at my tea, I read that you're a tea enthusiast. Does this... I am a tea enthusiast. All right, so this is this is kind of my lane here because I don't drink coffee. As I drink water. <laughs> ah, well, listen, uh, you know you can't. It's not all day every day might you know become a little too excessive. But I'm a I'm a heavy tea drinker here, and that's why we laughed last time where I was like, listen, they got matcha. That's I'm I'm down for that. What is your yeah. what is your favorite tea? Or what is the tea that you feel makes you? Because um, I feel like they have different functionalities sometimes. What are some of your What are some of your go tos and why? Well, I mean, I always have. I have this tin in the kitchen filled with packets of the throat coat tea. Uh, my favorite traditional medicinals is the one I go to. Yeah, traditional. Medicinals, but I know Yogi I makes have. the same one too. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I have the traditional medicinals um, throat coat tea. I always recommend that to people for vocal health reasons. Um, I also kind of adjacent to tea but for vocal health got into the um nimjang papakoa yeah mine's somewhere right the but syrup, yeah. and i also have the lozenges now so i have the syrup i have the hard candy lozenges that are like in my bag that goes with me to sessions yeah um uh peppermint tea is always really good always settles your stomach mm-hmm. 
Um, we have a few different blends here uh, as well. Like Cameron has Melbourne breakfast. So Ooh. it's like, a, you know, an Australian play on like, you know, an, an English breakfast or a Scottish breakfast or an Irish breakfast, which are all good. Black teas, breakfast teas. Um, I really like a good oolong. Not for me, but I see the appeal. Yeah, I really like a good oolong. Um, and some boba places will do like an oolong with um, like the, the cheese foam. So mm-hmm. just like the the foam on top, which is really good. Um, and there's this tea uh, that David's Tea does called Glitter and Gold. And it's a black tea. But it has like these little sugar pearls. That basically just when you, you steep the tea or when it brews, it releases like these like glittering particles ah, that's into fun. the tea. So it tastes really good and it looks really pretty. Um, <laughs> I'm all for that. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've been I've been trying um I had a, a blueberry pomegranate recently. I don't remember the brand, but that was not a two a mix of two different flavors that I had and I was pleasantly just surprised. You know what it was called? It was called like um uh, like dream or sleep something and it was a very nice tea to have mm. before I go to bed. I try to have different teas all the time, so I'm always I got to look into this glitter team. My God, that sounds like a, a really fun glitter, time. Well, yeah, I'll send you. I'll send you links to. to Please, everything. gosh, that sounds so much fun. <laughs> and then you know what I also I was curious about because I'm a big fan of. Uh, I'm a big horror fan. Let's just put it that way. And and okay. Castlevania kind of falls into that. I could see how people could consider that as a, a horror. I mean, it's got vampires yeah. in it. It's very gory. Very um, gory. Yeah. Is that was? Is, are you, were you a fan of that? Have you been now like uh, made aware of th- th- this genre and things like it as going to the cons and seeing people? Like, has this has have you found any things that are similar in genre that you really enjoy? You know, it's so funny because. Definitely growing up, I was like, no scary movies. I wasn't a horror person. Yeah. Um, and it was really funny, especially because at the time, people knew my work from Winx Club. Mm. Uh, and then to go into something like Castlevania, um, kind of the next big thing, a lot of people were very surprised by. Uh, <laughs> I think on paper, no one would have been like, oh, Alejandra, Castlevania. Um but I mean, and here's the thing, like, I'm on the show, but I appreciate it as a fan, because it's a good show. It's one of the best. Which is, I mean, it's amazing to be able to say that about yeah. something you've worked on. Um, but I, I love the team behind it, and I, I know how much amazing work in, went into it. And I used to, look, I would get the scripts, and they'd give me, like, the full script, and I would just go through, um, like, the PDF and, like, find specifically like pages that Sypha was on because uh-huh. I was like I obviously need to know my stuff I was like but I don't want to know oh uh, I don't yeah. want to know what else is happening until I see it yes and then especially like you know Isaac's storyline and Isaac getting really prominent because he's my favorite character on the show mm-hmm. like I never wanted to know what Ade was doing yeah um and so like that you know I always wanted that to be a surprise um but so you say, like, I, I'm more, I think, open to mm. horror now. It's not fully like a I can't do it because it's scary thing. Yeah, well, because I think I see there. the merits in 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 the genre. Yeah. Now, but I'm not a huge horror fan. Oh, that's fine. I will I say mean, that Castlevania is is kind of uh, w- one of the best uh, iterations. I think of of not necessarily horror, but I mean, even just in terms of the 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 story of Dracula and uh, that that kind of. Uh, story i don't think it's told in a better format than castlevania it's so like if anybody here hasn't watched it yet i i like i can't i cannot recommend it enough it is so good and they're making a a spinoff of it i Mm -hmm. i saw i remember you castlevania nocturne yeah that'll be really fun obviously yeah um i don't know if sypha will and i don't know if you can comment on that anyway but you know you never know who knows maybe (laughs) flash forward i'm not getting involved and i'm not getting in trouble yeah but i will say like it takes place hundreds of years in the future. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's not so. a prequel. It's a, it's a, just a spinoff, right? Or like a po, uh, what is it? yeah, right? Sequel. Yeah, yeah. That's it's just name. it's just another a story of another Belmont. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another Belmont. You As... know, because I mean, all the all the games like the you know they tell the story of a different Belmont, right? Yep. So there's a lot of latitude and material to 
to tell different stories. Was it surreal for you when you saw kind of like the opening credits and like number oh, one, yeah. you're in this you're in this series with you know like big time film actors, people who are oh yeah you know I I think like every single person on it's probably been in the Hobbit or at least half of them have been, you know in the Hobbit <laughs> yeah. movies. Uh, yeah. uh, to like see your name in like one of those title cards was that the, was that just do you remember the moment seeing that? It was insane, yeah. especially because I, I wasn't expecting it to be so front and center. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's just it's in the open and there's like, you know, the priest that gives you see his his arms outstretched and it's on his back. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was crazy. I mean, especially to, you know, you've seen like James Callis, Richard Armitage, Alejandro Hinoza, so like, oh, my God. Um, <laughs> talk about imposter syndrome. But it was um, it was wild. And then especially in like that first season, you had Lisa and you had Saifa. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of it for like. The, the women in the show. Yeah, and Lisa's... I mean, you had yeah. four episodes, so it's, you know... Well, um, true, they yeah. definitely make up for it in spades in later seasons. Yes, yes. Um, but, it, yeah, it was it was, it was was amazing um, and wild and, yeah. Yeah, I just, like, I remember... Because, uh, obviously, I had seen it and then going back and seeing it, I was like, holy cow, that must have been such a, like, a, a surreal moment, too, and just... Uh, these are not the things that we do this for by any stretch yeah. of the imagination, but it is... Uh, I, I always say this, too, and it's important for people to hear this. It's like when you aspire to work on really um, good work or good writing or a, a project that is of of the highest caliber, oftentimes you're working with people who are other really successful or famous actors. So while someone, I think if they're goal is to be like a celebrity i don't think that's a really good or uh, realistic <laughs> goal but to to want to work with like hollywood actors or famous actors people who are doing some of the best work out there that's like a people who are known because they've they've done the work that got them known yeah you know? that's like it's it kind of a you know, especially for you being so young and, and working on this project. And I'm sure they saw so many people. It's just like, I, I'm so proud for you living vicarious, you know, vicariously through that in that moment of being like, wow, that's such an accomplishment. And you should be so um, proud to like have been, I can't, I cannot imagine the amount of people that they um, were considering for, for that role. And uh, you, you it, it feels like it was hand tailored for you. So I just, I'll stop talking about it now and I'll get <laughs> off the damn subject of it, but I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm, it's one of my favorite series. So uh, it's just crazy. It's so crazy. Thank you. Yeah. What, what about the things that you're watching? What are, what are like the things that you consume then? If it's not, you know, if you're not, if you don't want to watch uh, people getting their head chopped off or if, things if of that nature. If it's not horror, what could you possibly what be could watching? You, what are the things that you uh, find either most pleasure in or inspiration from today? Today. Um, I mean, like everyone else, uh, I loved Arcane. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was a great experience. Yeah, we talked about that. I feel like your show set the the groundwork for something like Art Arcane to exist. Um, which is is wild and amazing, and also just like seeing everything that has come out, whether it's Blood of Zeus or Dota Dragon's Blood yes. or Arcane. Um, to see how good these shows are and how popular they are, and just how much content is now available. Mm in that space says monos and everything it's like w when castlevania came out there was nothing yeah and it was this thing of like well we'll see if you get to make more and i remember a chart coming out on um top 10 streaming shows in 2017 and castlevania was in the top 10 for netflix and it was the only non-live action show that was on the top 10 and for, you know for streaming numbers it was like a you know, whatever entity puts out, like, okay, these are the numbers on streaming, yeah. and, you know, it was across like Hulu and Netflix and everything. And that being like, a okay. And, you know, and then Netflix just paying attention to that and, and other creators paying attention to that and other creators coming to the medium because of it. Yeah. Um, you know, cause like blood of Zeus, the, the, the brothers behind that were, you know, film directors, like on camera. Yeah. And, you know, came to Powerhouse and, and started working on that show. And they have amazing actors on that show as well. Um, and I know that, you know, Arcane was, was in the works for 
years. Yeah. You know, and then they really put the time and effort into that. And, you know, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, um, J.B. Blanc, who plays Vander in that, uh, you know, is, is another, like, great coach and mentor who, like, I've studied under. And his thing is, there's no secret. It's just hard work. Yeah. And I just, like, that kind of came It's like, what's the, like, we're trying to figure it out. And it's like, yeah, we're all trying to, in hindsight, put a narrative on something. Mm. And it's like, yes, it is hard work. And it's it's putting in the time and the effort and the love and the care. And then it's just hoping that that preparation meets the opportunity because mm -hmm. we can't always explain why. Um, and I wish we could. Yeah. But yeah, it, it is wild to see just how much content is, is available now and how many stories are being told and diverse stories. We're seeing so many different kinds of stories being told now, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I really, really enjoyed Arcane. That was one where I was like, oh, that would have been amazing to work on. I know, I know. Um, you know, and um, yeah, I don't know, maybe. maybe you never know. Just, you you never, never know. know. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, Everyone start praying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. For me, too. Gosh. And, and for everybody yes. else, you know. It's... I'll pray for you. You pray for me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would love to get our, our audience uh, question. And I, uh, we, oh, yeah. we always love asking um, our, our listeners. And thank you for writing in your questions. I appreciate everybody here who does so. You can send in your questions to info at pointsofexperiencepodcast.com. I know that's a mouthful, but luckily you just go to the website or any of the show notes and it's going to be in there. So send your questions along, video or written, and uh, you might have a chance for it to be asked on the show. But uh, without further ado, I know we have a couple here. So Joe, if you want to um, yep. either read them off or pick the ones that Joe are... is on it. Yeah. When you got your role on Castlevania, did you think the show was going better than the video games? Um, well, I didn't have any experience personally playing the video games. Mm. Um, so I just got to approach it as, as a great story, you know? And, uh, I know that, you know, Sam and Adam, a lot of the team behind it were big fans of the game and played the game growing up. And so there was that love and respect paid to the source material, but it also wasn't hamstrung by it in a way that I think a lot of early adaptations were because they were more... I guess, well, we were talking about, you know, Paul, you and I about indication acting versus, you know, grounded, truthful acting. Mm. Um, and it's that sort of thing. It felt like earlier video game adaptations were just kind of indication of like, look, Easter eggs and IP and and watch the thing and give us money, um, which this, this wasn't. So mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I didn't have necessarily any barometer for was it going better or not. Yeah. But I know that it was a very special project to work on and that was evident the writing was great um you know it's 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 a lot easier to look like you're a great actor when the words are amazing and you know it's it's there yeah you're not having to work very hard to to mine it at all and you have a team that is behind you and is is so open to what your thoughts are about something um, and when you feel like you have that latitude and that trust, you, you kind of, you take that leap, you know, and you're, you're willing to discover stuff because you, you, you want to, to share and contribute. And so you get to discover stuff along the way, you know, and then you're working with great actors. Like I got to work with Richard Armitage, you know, and Tony Amendola and James Callis. So, uh, you know, whatever, whatever deficiencies I had, you know, I got to, <laughs> to lean on them. Having a great scene partner uh, can, you know, the elevation of just the, that back and forth and it's kind of why those prelay jobs can be so magical is what's created in that moment sometimes can't be created um, on one's own because you never know how you'll be inspired by hearing the words come out of somebody in a different way. And yeah, it's it's cool to, to, to be able to do it by yourself and, and to have that experience, but uh, um. I'm always there for that uh, that back and forth. Anytime I can get that, it's like, sign me up. Yeah. Joe, next question, please. And that was from Carol Lizzle, I believe. So thank you, Carol. Carol Lizzle, yes. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of Zs. Uh, so, okay, Tiffany R. Yeah. Um, have you thought about being a writer if you weren't a voice actress? 
And then mm. thanks for the recent fan mail reply that I received in the mail. Have I thought about being a writer? Um, it's funny. When I was a kid, the first thing, you know, when your parents ask you, like, oh, or your friend, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, when I was a really little kid, I wanted to be a writer um, because I liked books, but like, like a novelist or, you know, mm. um, and I just, I haven't thought about it in years. Um, but it was one of those things just because I loved living in books and, and, um, acting is basically, a, a more active and, um, like there are other people playing along with you, you know, it's like, it's a more active way of getting to live in those worlds. And like, there are other people who are encouraging and enabling it, you know, cause like you're going to a studio and it's like, Oh, like everyone else also believes that I'm in this world. <laughs> um, we're all, we're all doing this together. Um, but yeah, like, you know, reading books and getting lost in those worlds was always so exciting to me. And so there was, uh, some thought of like, Oh, like what if I wrote these? But yeah, I, I don't know that there's, a uh, any um anything really there but who knows maybe one day never count it out thank you <laughs> tiffany thank you and then we got one uh for both of you actually hi paul and alejandra i definitely enjoyed your role in ff origins as neon so i want to ask what do you think of the reaction and the memes surrounding the game's chaotic moments especially jack as a character <laughs> this is from swift I love it. I love the memes and, and all the fan interaction. Um, I think it was one of the best things that could have happened to the game early on, for sure. I, there was some trepidation when it first happened because um, there is also a sense, like, I know um, that Square and Team Ninja had a very clear image for, for what they were going for, and, and I think there was concern that it you know would be misunderstood because it is a very particular tone and a very particular brand. Um, but it like it to me, it's the fans are having fun with it and they're engaged and, uh, and people, people love it. People love the, you know, chaos. Mm -hmm. Um, and I love it too. So like when I interact with the fans on, on social, um, I bring it up all the time, you know, the fist bumps and, um, gotta kill chaos. And chaos. then I actually found, uh, like Dawnbreaker, I didn't realize that I had a line in, in Dota 2. Um, where she's like talking about chaos as well, and I was like, oh, it's just it's just popping up everywhere. <laughs> chaos is all around you. Oh gosh. Yeah. Well, thank embrace you. Embrace the chaos. Yeah, right. Embrace the chaos. I try to embrace chaos as much as possible, and I think that's <laughs> I think that's a comfortable place to live because it makes things exciting, mm. unpredictable. But you know, ho hopefully the chaos doesn't destroy everything around you, and I think that's the the part of chaos that's very. Uh, concerning or, or or damaging is it it can you can get consumed by it but uh thank you swift for or, or uh, uh for the question and um i love to ask this question we've been doing it more uh as much as i remember it because i i don't always remember things but i have been remembering um as the as the nature of this show is or the inspiration for it was was uh you know people's experiences in life hopefully can lend to be uh, learning experiences other than the things we've talked about already, whether associated with acting or not, was there a, an experience you've had in your life regarding literally anything that was memorable and taught you a lesson or inspired you in some way? Uh, did you find a leaf in the woods? Did you meet a, a ghost on a, a late night walk? Something that was an experience you had that, uh, that stood out to you and, and, and changed you in any way? Oh. <sighs> I think we have a lot of those moments, especially the older we get, because mm -hmm. <laughs> there's more opportunity for those moments. Um, there's been a lot of change in my life recently, um, which has made me, I don't know, I think like refocus. Um, but, and I was also thinking about, like, I got married last year, and I remember leading up to the wedding, I started booking like crazy like right up to it. Uh, and it was this moment of like, I was just, I was so happy and I was focused on something else entirely. And I didn't have the time or the energy to make my entire existence, my career. Mm. 
Right. And I feel like we've all had those moments where you see like, oh, like I was, I was focused on other stuff mm. and this happened. Right. And you know, you also can't play that game with yourself. Like, well, I'm, I'm focused on other stuff. Why isn't it happening? Waiting for emails are like, I'm, I'm booking a vacation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right but it's like there's there's no there's no actually faking out uh <laughs> fate or the industry or your career but it's like those moments of oh if i'm a happy and like full person and i'm like living my life and not just sitting here waiting for emails to come in <laughs> you know stuff happens and also people connect with with your work and with you as a person um but there is no way to manufacture that, mm. you know, because we all go through the ebbs and flows and you're working a lot and then you're not and then you're, you know, and, and you never know where the next job is coming from or when and you have to be okay with that. Mm. Um, but it's all a, a skill, you know, just being able to do that and, and just being mentally healthy. And, and I think, yes, you need to work hard and it's good to work hard and be focused. And, and I will always champion that study read, you know, look out, you know, search out resources. Like you were saying, you know, there, there wasn't necessarily when we were starting all of this freely available content mm. and, and access to really great people and great teachers and, and people with experience with points of experience. <laughs> and, uh, and now like there, there's, there's so much that's available to people. And like when you go to conventions and you do the panels, people ask you like, how do I get into voiceover? Or like, where? what's a good place to start? There are so many resources right now. Like, you can just Google it yeah. and you have so many things available to you. Whether it's D. Bradley Baker's, like, I want to be a voice actor.com or like your podcast or like I have a podcast from a few years ago. That's what I wanted I to actually talk it. to you about. But as things <laughs> go anyway. You know, but I mean, there's just so much available. And then like Yuri Lowenthal and Tara Platt have a great book, yep. voiceover, voice actor. Um which, you know, you can even go to your local library, you know, if, 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 if that's the case, um, there are all these YouTube channels, like, you know, there's so much uh, available to you. So, and yeah, so like seeking that stuff out is great. I did that. I took the deep dive and like, you make this your life, mm. but you also have to have a life, yeah. you know, and you have to have friends. Like, you know, you were saying before, like you and Ryan and young and I will grab coffee. And like, those are like the highlights of my week, yeah. you know, and, and it's so great. And yeah, we talked some shop, but then you, you start talking about other things and you talk about movies just because we like movies, yeah. you know, but, but not necessarily from, from a, a work or career perspective, Yeah, <laughs> you know, and that, that stuff is important, you know, and if you like to bake, bake, if you're like into cycling, like do that. And it's so easy to not, to not do those things because, you know, this is, it's a full-time job that you don't get paid for, mm. <laughs> you know, because your job is to audition, your job is to prepare, your job is to be prepared so, when the, so that when opportunities come, you can capitalize on them. But you're not getting paid to do those things. You just have to be willing and, and able to do those things. Mm. So that you can try and capitalize on them when the opportunity presents itself. But in the meantime, are you living a life? And, and you know, I got to check in with myself on that. The, the answer is not always yes, but it needs to be. And then, and then I do, and, and suddenly my work reflects that. But, yeah, it'll mess with your head, man. Mm -hmm. It'll... <laughs> <laughs> wow, there was so much in that. Um, thank you for sharing that, and I'm going to pat myself on the back to rem rem for remembering to ask it because that had so much in there, uh, so much important information and just kind of – well, my favorite part was I'm absolutely a thousand percent every time I book a vacation, I'm now going to go – I'm booking a vacation, uh, yeah. just so you know, uh, in case just, you want to... Just check to see if any emails trickle in first yeah. before you put the credit card information in. <laughs> oh my gosh, that was so great. Well, oh gosh. Yeah, be happy outside of all of this. This is all fun and this is all great and it's, all, it's, it's wonderful to talk about and helping people here is, is a great passion for me. But as you said, and it's a great reminder... You got to be happy outside of all of all of this fanfare and uh, um, the fun and 
because this could go away at any moment, not by any choice of our own sometimes. I mean, you can always be inspired to make your own content. Great. But we are, from a, a voice actor perspective, at the the service of writers and directors and there could be another strike uh, that happens with writers and we might not have so much content anymore. Who knows? Half of these streaming services could go down or a a video game company could stop making consoles. We don't know. So um, if you're not happy outside of this, then when you're not booking, it could get very dark. And I've been there. I've been there. I know many of us have been there. We've all we've all been there. Uh huh. <laughs> you know, and and there is, I think, such a sense of I can't show that, or somehow, you know, owning up to that will make me seem less professional or less skilled, or because yeah. there's so many people. You know, it happens to all of us. I mean, there's some people that are absolute rock stars and they're just constantly working. Yeah. <laughs> that hasn't that hasn't been me. You know, that hasn't always been me, you know, and that's okay Mm -hmm. because that's, that's normal. Yeah. You know, I think the, the union put out statistics, um, a few years ago about like how many auditions on average it takes to book a job. Yeah. We talk about that in the previous episode, which hasn't come out yet, but we talk about this, which is great. (laughs) Great. So if you've seen that episode, which you should have by now, <laughs> then you will know. There will be a quiz later. Yeah. But um, you know you, who you should have on the show is Zeno Robinson. You know what's so funny? He's he Literally, he is like one of the next names on my list to, to reach out to. Um, he is one of the biggest inspirations to me in this industry. I know. I met him a few years ago in, in a class. Yeah. Um, and like if you're talking about like someone who works hard, yeah. who puts in the time – you know, who, who like studied and like kept grinding for years. And you're, you're talking about resilience, like the idea of how close were you to making it or how close were you to that next booking when you stopped mm. or how much is enough or how, how worth it is it to you? How important is it to you? That's uh that's who you need to talk yeah, to. Yeah, I know. You know, it's so crazy is I think the email is already like written, but it's like one of the, we're, uh, I've I've crossed paths with you know a couple of times. Um, I've I've seen him just kind of like out and about, like in as people would say, like just on the streets of like where the the hub of all the voiceover studios are in that Burbank That's area. Funny. And uh, no, he's uh, I got to I got to work with him on High Rise Invasion, and that was kind of the first moment I saw his work. And I was so impressed, uh, mm. you know, like we talk about sharing, like you know we don't get to do these prelay moments, and I kind of wish. Uh, especially with someone like him, uh, I got to do that because he's so talented and seeing his success has been uh, inspiring. So ho- yeah. hopefully this is a reflective episode for anybody going, oh gosh, you know, I, he finally had him on. So yes, it will, we will have be having Zeno on if he wants to, <laughs> if he wants to, no pressure, Zeno. Um, but for you, Alejandra, thank you so much for coming on here and sharing thank your time you. with us and all of this. Um, I, I, I've been a, a fan of your work and uh, I, I've been a fan of you as a friend and as a human being. You are uh, such a kind and giving individual. You, uh, I mean, literally last time I saw you, you talk about, you know, baking and stuff. You brought, like, I, I'm a vegan, so I therefore have become complicated in, in, in certain types of situations. And you brought me little vegan treats and I was like, that is such a nice thing. <laughs> and it, um, it goes such a long way and it just, as a human being, when we value those things more than kind of like oh what am i this is going to be a terrible segue but i I've, I've i've walked myself here you know what am i working on and what is you know what is my value re- reflective of the jobs that i've done or the profile of the project it's been but you know when we value our relationships we value our mental health when we value uh, our humanity it's um i think that's where more magic and inspiration comes from anyway um, unfortunately, this leads me to the moment of saying, is there anything you would like to promote or where can people find you on social media? <laughs> uh, okay, well, you can find me on social media on Twitter and on Instagram at Ale Reynoso. And it's A-L-E-R-E-Y-N-0-S-0 zero zero, because my name with O's was taken. <laughs> <laughs> So they're zeros instead of O's. Um, and so I do have the podcast. It's Rolling Wild with Alejandro Reynoso. I haven't uh, done any new episodes in a couple of years. Um, I kind of did it 
you know, right pre-pandemic and then early on in the pandemic. And it was totally just born out of, you know, getting asked the same questions over and over again. Yeah. And, you know, how do I get into the industry and, and, and all of that stuff. And so it was a way to put it out there and it's free and it's available on the internet for anyone who needs somewhere to start. Um, it's a combination of like audio essays talking about topics, whether it's imposter syndrome or, or vocal health and, uh, and some uh, assorted interviews. Like I talked to Sam Dietz, the director of Castlevania. I talked to Josh Keaton, the spectacular Spider-Man. So you talked to Zeno on um, there and I listened to your last episode Zeno. with Ryan. So I highly recommend, uh, your, your podcast. <laughs> it's very good. Yeah. So, um, so that's there for anyone that needs it or wants it, uh, in terms of projects to plug, um, Obviously, uh, SOP, Final Fantasy SOP, is that is that the acronym people go with, or is you just say Stranger Maybe. of Paradise? I'm not that cool, but yeah, Stranger of Paradise, yeah. yeah. That's, I mean... That sounds right. Final Fantasy SOP. Final Fantasy Origin, yeah. <laughs> um, the DLC just came out for that, and... Um, yeah, I mean, mainly it's, I'm trying to, I'm in this weird space right now where I'm like, I've recorded some stuff, yeah. I don't know when it's coming out, like NDAs, um, some cool stuff coming, um, done some some really cool stuff that I, I never expected to do, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited uh, for this uh, new crop of, of content yeah. to come out. Um, and, and, you know, see, see what people think, you know, been working on, on some new stuff, like stuff that's new to me, mm -hmm. um, you know, in terms of the process and, and, uh, the medium sort of, yeah. um, so I'm excited. Yeah. I mean, a lot of stuff forthcoming, just have no idea when, as it is. Um, but I did, you know, and we didn't get to talk about this, but it was so cool. Artificial that you were a part of was one of the coolest things oh. I've seen. Um, uh, like the fact that it was like an interactive, interactive live action, um, AI story. That was so awesome. Like it was so cool. Yeah. It was live scripted, interactive AI yeah. drama. It's crazy. On Twitch. Yeah. Yeah. So innovative. I love that stuff. <laughs> we actually won a, a Webby for innovation. Oh my, there you, uh, rightfully yeah. so. And it has a, an Emmy and a Peabody as well. Oh my gosh. That's so cool. Yeah, I saw some of the episodes are available on Twitch, so you can go there and check that out as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, I jumped to your episode, so I, I know everything way out of context to uh, to see <laughs> your, your private and guest investigation skills. Um, yeah, at it's wild. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a crazy concept, and, and the character is also, you know, this wild uh, soap opera figure. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, Alejandra, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, what a fantastic episode with a fantas fantastic human being. Um, we'll have to have you back. Maybe there's something fun we can do with our own Warriors of Light. But um, have a... Uh, thank you so much, really. Thank you. Uh, I'll hopefully see you soon. Yes. Yes. Bye. Bye. Chaos. <laughs> Chaos. Chaos. Oh gosh, I love that. I love that meme. Did you see all those memes when they when they were around for that for the Final Fantasy game Origin? Yes, they there were some quite interesting ones if I if I should say so. I mean, I just love how any community whether it's a game or show or anything, people are just so passionate that it turns into like its own sub content, yeah, it's in still insanely good. Anyway, to enjoy, it's like I, I was, I was so happy that like they even ran with that because a lot of times game companies they won't, they'll just kind of ignore it and try and sweep it under the yeah. rug. But I think Square and everybody was just kind of like, yeah, this is kind of funny and let's embrace this, and <laughs> it brought kind of more popularity, and I think people respected that more than when. Like, cause funny stuff happens all the time and people try to like game companies all the time. They get memed out and they try to ignore yeah. it. And I think it isolates them from their fandom even more. And you know, how many times on this, on this podcast are we talking about the desire from fans and the game companies to have a, a, a real dialogue with the, with the, with the fans. So that yeah. way 
when something isn't going right or, you know, like we talked about with, with Sonic and stuff, when it actually can enrich the experience and make something a Sonic. We talk about one of the greatest animated movies of all time, which was a very surprising thing that people I don't think were necessarily expecting based off of the first initial responses. Yeah. And then we have something like Castlevania, too, where it was a limited series kind of show that only had four episodes. And it, it just goes to show the doubt that a lot of especially like Netflix and these new companies had with video yeah. game type series. So I'm I'm excited for more of that. Is is there a game, Joe, that or or something you would love to see adapted into like an animated series or vice versa with something that was an anime into a game that hasn't been done before? Have you is there something that you're curious to see? You know gotta say this. I just want them to make a remake of Death Note that isn't completely awful. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're making live action one. You saw that, right? See, the the whatever they put on Netflix, like I, I'm sorry, like it yeah, needs to, yeah, yeah, do it, do it again, just do it again. But, I don't know. I'll give you guys. What was it? COVID. Everything was correct. Do just do it again. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Death, Death Note's one of one of my, one of my favorites, one of your favorites, and yeah. to see it be done so dirty like that was uh, extremely disappointing. As uh, far as games, how insane would like a Diablo Ooh. series be? Because the lore is there with you know Tyrael and El Diablo. El, every it's all there. It's all how, there. How's it not been do, done yet? You don't have to do much. It's all. It's the story's there. That's a fantastic answer. I think that's like, I, I mean, I think that'd be amazing. Oh my yeah, gosh, how is absolutely. how is Blizzard not explored that? I mean, with Overwatch, they did all the animated shorts and stuff, right? Yeah. And I think maybe now with Diablo Four coming out, maybe they will explore yeah. that. Oh, that would be so amazing. Yep. Because they did a Warcraft movie, right? And maybe that kind of scared them because it didn't do so hot. <laughs> I loved it. I don't understand why everyone thought it was so freaking bad. Like I love that movie. <gasps> Yeah, it yeah. Wasn't like, I, I don't know. If you put people, you know, if you put like magic and orcs and stuff in a movie, I'll love it. So like, it doesn't. You don't really have to do much, but like, yeah, I'm I can, the same way. Yeah, I Lord know. of the Rings, you know, kind of the same deal. I mean, I'm I'm hopeful with the series. I think at least it'll be fun. With and we'll, you know, time will tell. Did you watch that show, The Wheel of Time, by any chance? I okay. So Sam loves reading. She reads yeah, like two so she, or three books a day. Mm. And she said that show is like one of the best book series ever. Yes. But when they translated it to a show, it was bad. No, it didn't do it too well. Mm. I, could, I can't speak to that because I didn't watch it. But Yeah. Basically, well, they're saying it didn't do the books justice. Which, But do you think that's a general response that people who read books have usually? Or is There's it a lot of it, book snobs for sure. Yeah, but I, but honestly, it's a good criticism because when you look at, you know, like Lord of the Rings, I think was an adaptation, but I think it's different. So here's the thing. I think when they try to make series from books, it's a lot harder because of budget and uh, it, rather than a movie. I feel like when me and Allie were talking about this, like when movies are made, it's like the, it, the effects look legit. Yeah, because it's like There's, two hours compared to like exactly. 20, 20 or 30 hours of filming. Like So when you space out, especially yeah. fantasy type of things, I feel like there's things that fall through the cracks. And she she was a huge yeah. fan of that show. Um, gosh, the Disney thing, like it wasn't fine. It wasn't Neverland. It was like um, with all the Disney characters or whatever. I can't remember the name of the show. And, oh, uh, you're talking about Kingdom Hearts? No, 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 no. But yes. So, no, what How is the name of the show? That? No, it's not that. It's not that. It's got like Captain. I mean, granted, you this know, is very all the much. the Disney characters, the guy with the key. The, the, the sword is a key. What is no. the name of that? The sword is a key. Kingdom Hearts is a is an animated series. I mean, that's what we're all waiting for. Really, that would be freaking fantastic. Yeah. Um, uh, God, the, the name keeps coming to me, and like the thought is going like this right now in my brain. It's coming and it's going. It's coming and going. Some it's coming sort and of going. Keyblade. It's not a keyblade. <laughs> oh gosh. Anyway, that, that similar deal where it was like you know they the, the effects just kind of look cheesy. You know, kind of like mm. Sabrina the Teenage Witch type stuff where people would disappear and come back and like the frame would be frozen. Like just I feel like in TV series that happens all the time and it's 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 just a hard thing to pull off. When movies, yeah. you know, they can dedicate the money and resources to making every little moment look freaking good. Um, but yeah, Diablo would be a great one. Uh, I would love to see more Castlevania. I know the spinoff is coming, so I'm going to patiently await that. And are they, uh, did they cancel Warcraft two, the movie? 
They just canceled it, or they made? Did they? I don't know. Someone in the comments will have to let us know. I don't know. Or you pull I mean, it up. Everyone here, said they did bad. I don't know. I don't. I think that would. I mean, they didn't do that with Mar- with all those Marvel movies, but you know what? Yeah. <laughs> all right. I'm yeah, get, yeah, yeah. I'm get hate hate mail for saying that, but. What the, that Marvel? Them. Yeah, well, listen. Not every single. I think Marvel, especially with the Avengers type stuff, they needed every movie to come out to to make Avengers happen. So, like, yeah. whether it did good or not, it didn't really matter. They were pumping everything out. Um, yeah, and I'm excited. I mean, that's a whole other conversation we could have for another day about the Marvel universe and to see where that stuff's going to go because it's going to be really freaking interesting. Um, but how about this? We'll end it on this note because uh, I, I, I and uh, Game of Thrones. New, the new uh, Targaryen Ooh, stuff's coming out. Are you excited about Ooh. that? You think that's going to be good? Is that happening soon? Yes. I, they had a premiere recently. I saw m- mutual friends of mine were at this premiere for uh, the Targaryen series. You saw an episode or something? I did not see an episode. I know people had seen it because uh, there was a premiere for it, so it should be coming out pretty soon. They got some big shoes to fill, but... Yeah. Did you... I mean, I didn't even look into who's like directing it and who, who's no. responsible, but... I don't know anything about it. I know not a thing about it, but I'm I'm hopeful it's good because I love uh, all that history and lore. Um, so it's about like the Mad King and stuff, right? Before I believe so. The tar- yeah, when Targaryens were ruling, so one of them. Anyway, uh, cool. Alej- Alejandro Runo. So I, I know we got off on a tangent there, but uh, what a fantastic guest! Awesome I guest. I'm I'm w- w- like I said earlier in this intro. I think we're gonna have Alejandro uh, Alejandro Saab. Um, and then that'll be uh, two of the strangers of paradise, uh, uh, the, those warriors of light. So um, that'll be really, really, really fun. Um, and yeah, she was just fantastic. And if you haven't seen um, Castlevania the series, I, I couldn't recommend it enough. If you haven't played Stranger of Paradise, I'm going to be playing it pretty soon. So if you want to watch me play it on Twitch, I mean, just stick around for that. If not, definitely pick it up and try it. And um, the Twitch it's- series that she did. Is also crazy. What were you gonna say, Joe? I said if it starts with final and ends with fantasy, <laughs> we're we're probably gonna be getting into it a little bit. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. In one way or or another. Ooh, so. man, we should have uh, Final Fantasy uh, voice actor guests on. We should get the guy who played Cloud. Wouldn't that be cool? I was just thinking that. Oh gosh, yeah. All right, everybody, please, as always, write in your questions to info at points of experience podcast dot com. Leave the review on Apple Podcasts, and um, I don't know, Joe. Give give our guests here some final words of wisdom to enlighten their lives as they continue their day, their drive, their workout, their whatever they're doing here as they listen to us. Well, all I can say is keep being a freaking nerd, okay? Don't let anyone tell you. Just keep doing it. Just be you. Like the thing. Play the game. Just do it. Heck yes. You'll always have a safe space here at Pox. Bye-bye.